morning, everybody. Welcome to um, our town hall with President Kirk Schultz and our brand new provost and Vice President Elizabeth Chelton. Um, welcome to the College of Nursing, and uh, we're very grateful for the time that you're spending here with us today and uh, dedicating this time to us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and to ask um, Kirk uh, to take it away. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, thanks, Kim. Thanks to everybody who's joining us this morning. Uh, we had a great hour-long meeting with the uh, College of Nursing leadership team this morning talking about uh, progress, uh, new research opportunities, new opportunities around the state. So uh, really excited uh, by that and appreciate all the work that you all are doing as faculty under really uh, challenging environments. And so I know many of you are dealing with things like uh, uh, education at home, K through 12 education at home that you might not thought you'd be dealing with, daycare issues, um, lots of other things. And so uh, just again, Elizabeth and I appreciate all that you do for WSU. So if I could have my first slide. And in the world of modern technology, uh, Ginger Druffles advancing my slides from Pullman. I'm in Spokane. You all are everywhere. Uh, we've now just gotten used to this uh, via Zoom. So uh, as we begin today, Washington State University acknowledges that its locations statewide are on the homelands of Native peoples who have lived in this region from time immemorial. The university expresses its deepest respect for and gratitude to those original caretakers of the region. As an academic community, we acknowledge our responsibility to establish and maintain relationships with the Native peoples in support of tribal sovereignty and the inclusion of their voices in teaching, research, and programming. We also pledge that these relationships will consist of mutual trust, respect, and reciprocity. So with that, I'm really thrilled today to introduce to you all Elizabeth Chilton, uh, our new Provost and Executive Vice President. So Elizabeth, take it away. Hello and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be joining you today. Um, although, of course, I wish it were in person and I look forward to the time when we're able to meet to meet in person. Um, so the next slide, please. <clears throat> I began my position as WSU's Provost and Executive Vice, Vice President on July 15th. Uh, so I just passed the eight week mark. And I moved to Pullman from New York in late June with my son, who's a rising college sophomore, and my husband, who, like myself, is a professor of anthropology. Um, and we also brought along our two rambunctious dogs pictured there in the middle in their favorite setting, which is snow. They're looking forward to that. Um, my research specialization is the archaeology of Northeastern North America particularly Native American history, ecology, and subsistence, um, in particular uh, diet and, and uh, some of the health impacts of changes in diet brought by um, the adoption of horticulture. Um, after spending five years at Harvard University post-PhD, I then spent 15 years at UMass Amherst. I was a faculty member, department chair, center director, and lastly, the associate, associate vice chancellor for research and engagement. I then served as dean of arts and sciences at Binghamton University in New York for three years before joining the Cougar community this summer. Um, so I am just, as I said, eight weeks into my position and the day-to-day -day COVID response work takes up much of my time as I know it does much of your time. Um, but some of the long-term issues I'm excited to work on over the next six months and six years, I hope, are uh, first of all, creating meaningful and productive system-wide partnerships and addressing th those issues of systemness that I heard a lot about during my interview and I continue to talk every day um, and, and think uh, long and hard. Actually, it was one of the things that really attracted me most to this position is, uh, is working on the sort of matrix organization and, and finding my role as provost in ways to support um, all of our campuses and colleges. Um, secondly, I, I bring a really strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to be saying a little bit more about that later in the presentation. 
Um, but finally, I really hope to, to model and promote a whole life philosophy. Uh, President Schultz sent out a, a campus-wide message or university-wide message last week about being kind to one, one another and being kind to oneself. And um, you know, part of equity and inclusion is doing just that, um, especially during these, these trying times. So thank you again for attending today's town hall and I look forward to our discussion. Uh, excellent. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in the uh, first, uh, as Liz was talking, I dropped off the Zoom thing twice. So if something happens and I just disappear, uh, I will be back. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. I keep getting an internet connection unstable uh, message. So I may switch internet providers if this isn't working. Uh, I will say that normally uh, we do a very quantitative data heavy uh, part of describing university accomplishments. Uh, this year, uh, we decided to go away from quite that much data. Most people suffer from Zoomitis as it is. And so we have some data slides, but we've really tried hard to, to minimize that. So um, one of the things that we wanna talk about in terms of institutional achievements uh, is we, completed our first ever WSU system strategic plan this year. Uh, we've always had a Pullman plan that was the de facto system plan, kind of what was good for Pullman uh, was good for the entire system. And I think we recognized a year or two ago that we really need to start thinking about what are our system goals and objectives and what are different campus goals and objectives. I know uh, WSU Spokane is working on a strategic plan and Elizabeth and her team is also working on a Pullman based strategic plan. And uh, more details on that will come out over the upcoming year. But this will be the first time there's been separate, distinctive uh, planning efforts around the system and Pullman as a campus. Uh, we are really thrilled this year to also launch uh, the, a new center. Uh, it's a Center for Research in Emerging Infectious Diseases in Nairobi. WSU's had a strong presence in Africa and Nairobi and Kenya. Uh, for a number of years uh, from the National Institute of Health and Elizabeth, if you'd be so gracious, maybe while we're waiting for Kirk's uh, connectivity to improve, if you could take over his slides for a second. Probably um, because he knows what he was going to say about that. Um, Ginger, would you mind just advancing to um, to the the college specific, and then we can come back to his to his part. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, so um, first of all, um, just go back one slide. Um, the World Health Organization dubbed 2020 the year of the nurse and midwife, and it certainly has been. Nurses all over the world faced a generation-defining challenge in caring for COVID patients and in the process gained even greater admiration and respect from the public. I'm sure it's become, though, much more difficult to educate the next generation of nurses as clinical sites close um, social distancing protocols have made it much more complex for students to develop their skills in labs and sims. Nursing researchers, like others across the university, had to um, pause their studies. Despite these challenges, the College of Nursing has created a number of milestones this year. It gained new leadership with the hiring of Dr. Mary Coithen and celebrated its 50th anniversary. I know that the college is no stranger to online education, and I learned a little bit more about that this morning with the college leadership team, but faculty have shown true resilience in devising innovative ways to educate students this semester, and research have brought, researchers have broadened the scope of their work to encompass aspects of the COVID pandemic. I do want to welcome and, and thank uh, our new Dean, Mary Coithen, in, uh, uh, in beginning this section. Um, she was named Dean in April. She was formerly Associate Dean for Student and Community Engagement in the College of Nursing and an Anne Furrow Professor of Integrative Nursing at the University of Arizona. 
She brings more than 30 years of academic and leadership experience in nursing, and she's focused much of her work on improving community understanding of integrative healthcare delivery models and how to best bring therapeutic strategies from biomedicine and more traditional healing methods. So thank you for hosting us today, and I look forward to working with you, Mary. Now the next slide. I was impressed to learn that the college is now ranked 23rd nationally by NIH. Uh, and as I'm beginning to get to know the college, I've been impressed at the breadth of faculty research. Um, just a couple that jumped out at me, there was so much, but um, the phone app for young people with asthma during wildfire season, I, I'm thinking I, I might wanna take a look at that app right about now. Um, cloth mask, mask design when N95 masks are not available. Um, really timely developing a police fatigue risk management strategy for the Seattle Police Department and much, much more. So as I, as I get to know the university and the college better, I look forward to learning more about the breadth of your research. Now the next slide. Um, I learned that nursing joins the College of Pharmacy now in operating from the PNWU campus in Yakima and the move opens new avenues for interprofessional education in the Yakima Valley and just as soon as I'm able to travel I want to I want to take a look at that at that campus and and learn more about what's going on. Uh, next slide. I was also very happy to learn that there are several initiatives in inclusive excellence underway, including, as I understand it, a listening session with students to identify gaps, needs, and opportunities, um, adoption and implementation of holistic admissions across programs. I'm really excited to learn uh, more about that and, and how it might be a model for uh, the university system as a whole. Uh, multiple avenues for faculty student education beginning in September with Cleveland visiting scholar presentation by Professor G. Rume Alexander. Next slide, please. So uh, I've learned that a number of faculty and staff have been honored this year, including Celestina Barbosa Liker was elected to Washington State Academy of Sciences. Rene Huxul, Shelley Fritz, and Kakab Shishani um, were all named fellows of the American Academy of Nursing, one of nursing's highest honors, as I understand. Janisa Graves received the 2020 WSU President's Award for leadership uh, in fa for faculty and staff. Tracy Klein was inducted into the Nurse Practitioners of the Oregon Hall of Fame. And Debbie Brinker has been named a 2020 YWCA Woman of Achievement in the category of Science, Technology, and Environment. I apologize if I've missed any other kudos. These were ones that, that certainly jumped out to me as I uh, started to learn about the college and I wish you all warm congratulations. Um, do we have Kirk back? Yes, I am back. I'm outside <laughs> and I uh, have a, my second internet spot to hopefully mean I won't get dropped this time. So sorry do you about this. Do you want to pick up where we are, Kirk? We're at slide 16. Uh, yep, I've been following along, so. Okay, excellent. Do we want to, I'll do a fiscal update, then we'll go back and we'll grab those other things. So um, sorry, even, all of us, none of us are immune to some of the challenges. So uh, in terms of fiscal updates though, uh, one of the things that we will keep trying to do is keep everybody updated about where we are fiscally as an institution. Uh, I wanna remind folks too that we will uh, pass on the data that we have, but uh, we don't always have great information. So for example, if somebody says, well, what exactly is gonna happen with the state of Washington and the higher education budget for this next year and the answer is we still we don't know any more now than we did really in may or june and we don't expect there to be a special session of the washington legislature uh, so that means we may not know anything different until january or february so i don't want people feeling that we've got data and information and it's bad or it's good and we just don't want to share it uh, we just want to make sure that before we put anything out that we're really careful uh, about uh, what we say in terms of our fiscal affairs. So next slide, please. Those of you who've been uh, at these for the last several years know this is a slide I've shown each year uh, for the last five years. 
Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, what this shows, the green bars represent when we actually bring in more money than we spend. Um, and typically, if we do that, you take those extra dollars, you invest them in things, or you put them in your reserve funds. Uh, when I arrived, uh, we were already spending about 20 to $25 million a year, more than we were bringing in. That's those red bars that you see. And then in FY 2017, we had the largest overspend. That was nearly $30 million more than we brought in. And if you all remember, we put in place a, a goal to within three years to be back in the black. So that the idea would be in fiscal 2018, we reduced our overspend to 20 million, fiscal 2019 reduced overspend to, to 10. And then by FY 2020, we would be back in the black. Uh, thanks to our deans, vice presidents, chancellors, you all as faculty, uh, we exceeded that by a significant amount. Uh, if you remember in FY 2018, those of you who were here, uh, we cut our spending to somewhere about 7 million uh, over. And then by the next year, FY 2019, we were back in the black. And then we really finished FY 2020, you can see there with nearly $29 million in uh, extra um, and uh, additional revenue that came in. Now, when you see that uh, and you come to the president's office, you're probably looking under my desk going, where's the $29 million? I got some great ideas. Where this money is, is this is out in the colleges and units. Uh, some of this, a little small portion of this would be on central reserves, but largely this is because our colleges have done such a great job at managing their resources. And because we had this reserve, uh, we were able to mitigate some of the potential cuts this year and allow uh, deans and others to spend some of these reserve funds so that uh, we didn't have to cut as deeply uh, as we might have uh, given the situation where our state is. The bottom line though, you can imagine if we were trying to deal with COVID in FY 2017, where you already had a significant spending problem. So uh, the good news here, everybody's done a great job and we're well prepared to deal with some the financial issues that we expect around COVID-19. Perhaps then we can try and go back to the, the slide that I was on when my internet cut out. All right, um, I was viticulture and enology. Um, many of you know in the, in the last campaign for WSU, we built a state-of-the-art viticulture and enology center uh, in the Tri-Cities in Richland, Washington. Uh, it's probably the nicest research and teaching facility uh, for wine science in the country. Uh, what we did not have is a viticulture and enology designated degree. And that was sort of the next step as we support the wine industry. This will be located, the degree program in the Tri-Cities. All of our students will be there. The, the reason that that makes so much sense is they're right in the middle of wine country. And this is a hands-on uh, oriented degree. So our students can be in the classroom in the morning. They can literally be in the vineyards uh, working on wine production and those types of things in the afternoon. So we think that the combination of placing us uh, this program right around the Washington wine industry is going to be really, really important. And then finally, the uh, the transformative the transformative change initiative uh, really gets at us trying to make sure that we're doing a better job with student retention. Uh, this is a significant effort across all of our physical campuses. It's run out of Elizabeth's office, and we want to continue to make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to improve those retention numbers across all demographics in the WSU system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're also uh, thrilled with many of the faculty honors that we see, and we have a dedicated and gifted faculty at WSU across multiple disciplines. Uh, so trying to take all of the achievements and place them on one slide, uh, we'll never get there. But we wanted to hit a few kind of key things that we thought were really, really important. Uh, to begin with, we had seven faculty elected to the Washington State Academy of Sciences. Uh, Tim Baszler in the Paul Allen School for Global Animal Health. Uh, Kelly Brayton uh, in veterinary microbiology and pathology, also in veterinary medicine. Laura Griner Hill. Uh, the Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Affairs, uh, who's also a, in uh, Human Development and Connors. Uh, Alara McLean in Sociology, uh, Michael McDonald uh, in the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine, Sterling McPherson and the Director of Biostatistics in the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine, uh, Katrina Mealy 
uh, who is in the College of Veter Veterinary Medicine, and finally, Chin Zhang, uh, who's director of the Center for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems, uh, also in Connors. Now, one of the things that we want to do is encourage all of you as faculty to uh, submit names and uh, nominate your colleagues for these awards. I know there's some great faculty in nursing that are certainly deserving of being in the Washington Academy, and I hope that we can see some additional colleagues there. Uh, we also had uh, this, this last year, uh, three of, uh, of our colleagues here named Fellows of the American Academy of Nursing. Uh, Renee uh, Hoeksel, Shelley Fritz, and Kakab Shoshone will be inducted in late October. There's only 230 people nationally, uh, worldwide, excuse me, being recognized for their contribution to health and healthcare. Just really appreciative of, of these three colleagues and let me extend the congratulations on this type of career award. Finally, the Heinz Award. Stephen Heinz from the College of Vet Med uh, was awarded fourth place in the international competition for instructor creativity during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're gonna see a lot more of these types of things, I think out there as you all as faculty continue to do creative things in the classroom, uh, in instructional spaces and in clinical spaces uh, with our students. And we're gonna share those uh, over the course of the year. And I think we're gonna to continue to see this fantastic innovation uh, by our faculty at WSU. Next slide, please. Well, as an engineer, I had to show at least one or two graphs. I just couldn't do that uh, without, without uh, I couldn't have no graphs in a talk. Um, I wanna congratulate all of you as faculty. The College of Nursing, I know, continues to grow your research portfolio, your funded research portfolio. As an institution, we finished it right under 370 million in externally sponsored research. This is exceptional, and this is a tribute to you all as faculty. Uh, you keep finding large grants, so you're successful, you're putting together really cutting edge programs and competing uh, against the very best in the nation and winning. And I think this is amazing if you look at where the university was as a whole just 10 years ago, where we are today, 400 million is right around the corner and we keep seeing excellence uh, out of the health sciences. And I continue to, to believe as we find more collaborative partnerships with our faculty colleagues, not just at WSU, but across the system, it's really gonna help us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we had a, a fabulous year uh, in intercollegiate athletics as well. And that was highlighted by our women's soccer team who finished uh, in the fourth nationally uh, and qualified for our first college cup, which uh, is a big tournament. And uh, those of you who follow women's soccer, uh, we had to win, I think, three or four consecutive away matches uh, against teams that were much more highly ranked. And it was a special group of young women. It was great to see them come together and rep the, represent uh, the university in this way. Uh, academically, we also had a great year. Uh, we had, uh, for the fifth straight semester, our, our student athletes maintained their highest cumulative GPA at 3.17. And for the first time in school history, all athletic teams averaged a 3.0 GPA in the spring semester 2020. Uh, Pat Chun is our athletic director, has done a fabulous job at uh, making sure that we have uh, student athletes and has emphasized that we need to have success in the classroom if we're going to have success on the field. He's hired coaches that believe that, and we're really starting to see uh, those types of things out there. Finally, the Cougar Athletic Fund had a record fundraising year by raising nearly $27 million in cash and pledges. Uh, the last record uh, was about 15, so they almost doubled on the previous record. And as we look at intercollegiate athletics moving ahead, that private support is gonna be really important uh, for us. Next slide. Uh, finally, uh, in this section, we had some really noteworthy philanthropic achievements this last year. Uh, even despite COVID-19, we raised over $125 million uh, for WSU and we're off to a great start already this year. Uh, I know that the College of Nursing is currently doing a search for a, a new director of development. And I look forward to myself and Elizabeth and Daryl and Mary and others uh, out there securing investments to help you all do the great job that you do. Uh, this last year, our largest, most significant gift was from uh, Bruce Admonson and Julie Parker. They established our second endowed deanship uh, at WSU and the Murrow College, and also did our first endowed athletic director position at, at WSU. Finally, we had a lot of Cougs uh, and friends of the university, parents and so forth that stepped up, contributed more than $200,000 last year 
for COVID-19 student relief funding across all of our campuses. And we're gonna to continue to solicit uh, that kind of investment support uh, to help us move forward this really challenging time. Next slide. All right, since we've done these, let's go ahead and move through to the end. Uh, you all get to see the slides a second and third time. That's kind of a bonus. All right. Uh, what we want to do is fi finish up here in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes with some of the work in strategic planning and new initiatives that we think it's really important uh, for you all to be aware of. Next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned our uh, system strategic plan. Uh, is one thing to write a plan, to now the hard part starts and that's implementation. Uh, one of the things we really want to make sure that we didn't do uh, was write this fantastic plan, have beautiful graphics, we put it on a shelf and four years from now we blow the dust off it and say, hey, time to do another one. Uh, if plans are effective, they're used for decision making and they're tied into budget. Uh, and so uh, the regents approved our plan in June and now what we're doing is working really hard on what that could look like in terms of implementation. Uh, Chris Hoyt in my office uh, is the executive that is tasked with continuing to lead uh, not just the planning, uh, not just the plan development, but our planning efforts. And uh, we're going to continue to work in this regard. We're also uh, developing a Pullman a strategic plan and Elizabeth and her team uh, are working on that. I mentioned that earlier, and that's also an important thing moving ahead. I will say before we move to the next slide too, um, every time we meet with leadership, with faculty leadership, anything, uh, the development of an improved budget model comes up. Uh, Elizabeth is in her role as provost, will work with Stacy Person, our vice president for finance administration to put together an executive budget committee whose task will be to formulate a, a new budget model. Elizabeth did a lot of this work at UMass Amherst. This is not a knock it out in two or three weeks type of thing. This will be a long-term multi-year effort, uh, but it's important that we have some uh, clarity to how we spend our money, how we distribute our money. And when people come on board as leaders, they should understand how we budget, and how we budget for new initiatives. Right now, what we have is largely uh, duct tape together amalgam of different budget deals that have been made over the last 20 or 25 years. And, and we just need some systemic uh, change to the way that's done. Next slide, please. Elizabeth. You just have to remember to unmute. Um, well, uh, archeologists like data too. And uh, I'm, I'm known for my love of bar charts. <laughs> and uh, I did want to provide an update our, on our enrollment system-wide since many of you have been asking about this. Um, first of all, this is preliminary unofficial data, uh, but just to give you an idea of where we stand now. First of all, our system-wide enrollment is down slightly um, but less than 2% from the all time record last fall. So um, much, um, much better than we had feared, um, especially in looking at a number of our peers across the country. Our ethnic diversity is still just over 30% as is our percentage of first generation students system wide. Enrollment at the Pullman campus will be down about 1,100 students um, to 19,800 total, in part because of freshman deferrals to spring or to next fall. Um, WSU Health Sciences has the largest enrollment in its history at 1,730 students, and Global Campus probably understandably saw the largest increase, enrolling a record of over 4,000 students, um, more than a 22% increase uh, from last year. Um, I did also want to mention that we're hiring a vice provost for enrollment management. Um, we're bringing in the finalists over the next two weeks, and uh, we hope to bring in someone by the end of October, or certainly make the offer by the end of October. Um, this is a really critical and important position. Enrollment management oversees everything from recruitment to application to um, enrolling students across the entire system and working with registrars across the system. So um, we have not had a full-time enrollment management professional um, in recent 
history. And so um, the people who are on the short list are really leaders in this area. And I'm looking forward to them coming in and joining us and helping us work on a number of the system enrollment issues. Next slide, please. Um, there we are. Yes. So I know, uh, Kirk, I think you'll start out with the first part of the slide and then I'll focus on the provost area initiatives. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is uh, a major issue and a major initiative across the system. And all of our campus locations are doing a lot of work in this particular area. So Elizabeth and I just want to highlight a couple things and uh, certainly happy to have some dialogue and discussion about this in the Q&A. Uh, the five working groups uh, were formed in 2017 uh, based on uh, some issues that our students, faculty, and staff brought forward on the Pullman campus. Uh, these working groups have been working since that time and have made great progress uh, on a lot of things. And I want to express my appreciation to Vice President for Student Affairs, Mary Jo Gonzalez, and Associate Vice President uh, Jamie Nolan uh, for the work that they have continued to do um, in this space moving forward. Uh, one of the recommendations that came out of some of that was to establish a President's Commission around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we hope to get that group stood up uh, sometime later this month. Uh, Elizabeth and I are actively meeting with our Black Faculty Staff Association. We've set up monthly meetings. We've had a couple meetings so far to talk about what types of things can we do to recruit and retain more Black faculty and staff across the WSU system, uh, as well as Pullman. Uh, that's, um, this, it's a system-wide initiative, but in Pullman, uh, our numbers of black faculty and staff are particularly small, and it's something that's a long-term uh, problem and uh, needs a long-term uh, set of issues to address, and Elizabeth will talk about that a little bit more. And finally, we have a group that's chaired by Mel Netzhammer, uh, Chancellor of our Vancouver campus, and Zoe High Eagle Strong, who's our Director of Native American Programs in Pullman, uh, to look at a lot of our policies through an equity lens. We have a lot of policies in the way we do things at WSU that we've done for 25 or 30 years and really haven't gone back and looked at those types of things. And Elizabeth will bring a specific example of, of something that we need to change to recognize the time that we're in. I just wanna, before asking her to talk, I want to emphasize that these efforts are ongoing. They have been ongoing. And uh, while uh, some of the issues around Black Lives Matter this summer have brought these to the forefront, it's not the type of thing that because of that, all of a sudden we're doing things. This has been a long-term effort and we have to keep at it. So Elizabeth, uh, look forward to hearing your comments here. Yes, thank you, Kirk. Um, so uh, there are a number of initiatives um, that are coming out of the provost's office that I wanted to let you know about. Um, first of all, I believe Dean Coithen might have mentioned to many of you um, that this fall we will launch a new cluster hire in racism and social inequality in the Americas. And the goal of the cluster hire is to seek scholars who will contribute to work in this area and help lead institutional transformation at WSU across the system. In recent years, academic institutions have utilized these kinds of cluster hires to attract and retain a more diverse faculty. And I have done so at my two previous institutions. Cluster hires allow the building of cohorts of scholars who can support and mentor each other as well as mentor us. Um, and aside from recruiting and retaining a more diverse faculty, when paired with an explicit network-based mentoring program, uh, these kinds of cluster hires can transform the institution from the building of new curricula, research foci, and community engagement. Um, so I'm looking forward to, um, to, to um, initiating that this fall. Secondly, uh, we've had a position in the provost office that's been vacant since May, but we're about to put out a, an internal call for applications for an associate vice provost for inclusive excellence. We're looking for someone who is a tenured faculty member um, and the associate vice provost will, will bring leadership to academic affairs and um, the person who holds this role will identify and implement best practices and evidence-based approaches to things like faculty hiring, tenure and promotion, a uh, number of the policies, policies and procedures that Kirk was talking about 
um, research support, um, teaching and mentoring, and curricular planning. Um, this person will also lead the cluster hire program for my office. Um, I do want to acknowledge that, as Kirk said, this is all building on work done by others um, and the AVP will coordinate with existing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in the Division of Student Affairs, the Office of Compliance and Civil Rights, Human Resources, um, and other offices across the system. Um, and finally, I did want to mention we're about to send out the annual memo that always comes out from the Provost Office this time of year. Uh, announcing the, the uh, processes for application for sabbatical. And of course, professional leaves are an important opportunity for a tenure stream faculty to advance their scholarship. And in the past, I understand that it was an unspoken rule that one was expected to be physically distant from one's home institution during such a leave. Um, and in fact, I believe I learned yesterday that it actually was codified that way many years ago, um, but the fact that it changed did not change the sort of oral history about um, what makes a successful leave application. So um, it's really clear that making uh, um, th that condition that one leave one's home institution significantly disadvantages those who have caregiving obligations economic constraints um, or really can simply do the work they need to do uh, from their home from their home institution so in the next call that we're literally sending out i think either today or, or early next week we're going to make it clear that the physical location of a sabbatical will not be a criteria for the evaluation of the potential effectiveness of the leave um, this was one of the many things brought to our attention uh, by a group of women faculty and staff, um, but to me, it's just simply best practices in terms of supporting equity and inclusion. So I'll turn it back to Kirk. Well, I, I spent a, uh, my career, part of my career before I moved here at Kansas State University, and I thought there is nowhere in the country that has a more antiquated system for uh, finance, human resources, and K-State, I moved to WSU and found one. Uh, so one of the projects that we've done over the last several years uh, is uh, so we started in 2016 was implementation of Workday uh, as a major finance, human resources, and so on uh, system for us. I appreciate many of you out there have been working on this diligently uh, to make sure that we have a smooth transition. Originally, we were going to stand it up on July 1 of this summer because of COVID-19 and just concerns that we weren't as prepared as we wanted to be. We pushed that to January 1 of 21. So uh, this is going to uh, this implementation is going to be happening uh, over the course of the academic year, and uh, we really want to encourage you all to do some of the training sessions that are going to be available. Uh, we're going to have 31 different training courses, 100 step-by-step -step reference guides, 30 video or self-paced learning experiences. Uh, these will start to become available in October. It's important that everybody uh, get involved a little bit in educating yourself. Um, again want to thank all of the folks that have been involved and engaged with this this is a huge monster project and i want to remind everybody there will always be some bumps in the road no matter how much planning we do with something like this and we'll just ask everybody to continue to be flexible work together but i think our ability to uh, use data to help us make university and system level decisions i think it's going to be very helpful by having a work day up and fully operational uh, next slide, please. Well, we uh, I'm sorry that we had to bounce around because of my uh, not so great internet connection. Uh, when we're done with this, I'm going to go unplug my internet and replug it in and reset it, see if that doesn't help for our next one. Uh, but thank you for all that you do. Uh, thank you for this college and the impact that you're making on our state and region. Uh, and thank you for your flexibility as faculty uh, in this really challenging COVID-19 environment. Uh, it's great to see the successes in nursing and Elizabeth and I wanna make sure that we're here to, to work with you uh, and provide the resources necessary for Mary and Daryl and all of you to, to do the job that you wanna do so much. So with that, thank you and uh, wanna answer some questions. And Elizabeth, you put something in chat. I think you had several people ask you uh, around climate change. So 
maybe you want to address that uh, verbally. <laughs> well, um, really just, uh, I, I'm glad that people were asking about it. I was a little surprised. We've done a few of these so far and no one has asked me about, about climate change. And of course, I'm, I'm just getting to know the WSU research and scholar community. And so, you know, Kirk may actually know a lot more about the work that has previously been done, but just simply to say that, you know, it's, a, it's an area that I have at least dipped a toe in um, as an archeologist. Um, I did some work in New England because there was a question of what the antiquity of controlled burning was in New England. And so modern conservationists had argued that native peoples had been conducting these large scale controlled burns um, and that we modern conservationists needed to do that to maintain the sort of um, natural habitat, if you will. Um, so I got together with some ecologists and we said, well, let's test this because the only records we had of those burns by native peoples were accounts written by Europeans. Um, some of them not written until the 18th century after there had been 150 or 200 years of, of interaction. And so we said, let's look at the archeological record. There are tens of thousands of archeological sites in New England uh, 10,000 just in Massachusetts alone. So we looked at the New England coast. We ended up just focusing on the coast because we had good lake cores. So we could look at the fire history, the pollen records, um, temperature and hydrology, and then compare that to Native American land use. And surprising to me and everyone else, uh, we found that there was no large scale cutting of trees and burning of forest prior to European settlement. It's literally like the charcoal signal is like this and then like 1600 comes and it the fire and land clearing, it's, it's like a light switch went off. Um, and we didn't expect this. We expected as you get origins of agriculture starting around 900 AD that you would see increased land clearing and then it would just sort of be, you know, certainly accelerated by Europeans, but not, this was like a light switch. But what's really interesting, if you, it was published in Nature Sustainability. It's really interesting. If you go and you look there, there were published um, critiques and then we of course got a chance to respond again. The people actually said that we were well, the term racist was used because they said that we were denying the sophistication of Native American cultures by saying that they didn't cut down large scale amounts of trees and burn them all down. Um, and I still can't quite figure that out. Um, we didn't say that they didn't use fire. We said that there were thousands, tens of thousands of people and tens of thousands of years of, of sophisticated land use, um, but they didn't cut trees down by the acres and they didn't use burning on a landscape level. That was the conclusion. Now, you know, you can never prove that they didn't do that. All we can do is use the evidence that we have to interpret this, but the, it's been so interesting, the emotional and vehement response to this. So if you're curious, we also published um, uh, in, in the conversation, uh, we pu published a, a, you know, a sort of accessible, just short view of this. And we also, which is open source, it's called Behind the Paper, where we actually talk about what some of the conversations. So anyway, that's, that's as much as I could say about my dipping my toe into thinking about climate change and, and really trying to understand um, the, the human role in this and how it sort of triggers these um, emotions that we have about the environment and about our responsibility. Sometimes we need to just sort of get back to the science of it. And that's, that's where I come down, certainly. But in terms of what WSU has done, you know, I'm in my infancy on, on that piece. I don't know if Kirk has more to add. Um, uh, Elizabeth, thank you. And uh, it's, it's great to have you still do an active scholarship and be able to to, to talk about that. Um, WSU though, I think as a whole has pockets that have worked on, I'll say the general issues of climate change and sustainability, but probably has not elevated to a system level conversation the way that it needs to 
Uh, I think when we did some of our system strategic planning, this was one of the things that was mentioned several times is there doesn't seem to be a coordinated uh, large scale effort in this particular area. Um, there's a lot of work going on and a lot of you are doing great work in this space, but uh, I think that's an opportunity as we explore system initiatives over the next four or five years to see what that could look like. Um, the other thing that I want to mention that was a different question that was asked ahead of time uh, as we were preparing for this was uh, really around, uh, if I say, the area of furloughs. Uh, and, and somebody asked, uh, well, we see they're not going to happen this year, but what about for the 21-22 academic year? And uh, just to give some background, we had actively thought we were going to need to do some sort of a furlough program uh, for this academic year. Uh, went a long ways down that planning uh, of, to get there. At the end of the day, there were just some serious equity issues. Uh, our staff members and uh, career track faculty were going to have to take a uh, furlough. Our tenure track faculty were not going to because of the way our faculty handbook is written and things. And it was going to be a very disparate uh, type of thing that we felt would be much more divisive than anything else. And so Stacy Pearson and her team were able to come up with ways to meet the state uh, cut guidelines uh, using some reserve funds and other things. So I'm really, really thrilled that we didn't have to do that this year. To be honest, until the legislature meets, uh, we're just simply not going to know what our budget cut or not might look like for that 21 year. And until that happens, uh, we're just not going to uh, know if we would have to do any type of furlough. Uh, I don't want to do one. Uh, I don't want to do salary cuts for anybody if I can help it. But uh, we won't do a furlough program that has got serious inequities. And any furlough program we did would be graduated that the highest paid individuals at the university would take the largest uh, cuts or furloughs. Uh, and then there would be a base level under which uh, those individuals making a certain amount of money would take no uh, cuts or any type of furlough. I think that's the only way to do it if you have to do it. And uh, we'll keep everybody appraised. But right now, no plans to do that. Uh, but uh, we got to wait until the legislature really meets in January and February and see where we are. Are there other questions that people might want to put in the chat or things like that? I don't uh, appreciate so many of you being here with us. Um, and if there's nothing else that comes up, uh, yeah. Kim, Mary, do you have anything else? I have a question. Um, so I think I'm curious, President Schultz, about what lessons you've learned by leading through this pandemic. Yeah, boy, every day I ask myself uh, uh, what types of lessons I've learned. Um, I've served as a president now in my second recession, which is not a, not a great thing. Uh, but I think we learned a couple things in the last recession that uh, have I've watched not just us, but other universities do. The last recession, a lot of us did crisis communication and then just kind of cut it off as soon as it looked like things were getting better. And I just think the uh, senior administration's communications with faculty and staff tended to be only when there's a crisis, only when there's a budget cut, and then you shut it off and never hear anything the rest of the time. I think one of the things that we've learned is it's almost impossible to over communicate in this time because the faculty rumor mill has been alive and well at every university I've worked at. And uh, the only way to counteract that is to provide data and information in a timely fashion. So. One of my goals is to make sure that faculty members and staff members have to work to be uninformed. Uh, you know, you're gonna have to really try uh, to do that. So I think uh, continue to communicate has been something I've learned. The second thing is when we did our first town hall, not this kind of town hall with faculty, but we did our first broad-based YouTube-based town hall, I remember thinking, boy, if we have three, 400 people, you know, I'll consider this a, a success. I think we had 4,500 people tune in uh, to hear. We did our 10th one yesterday, still had over a thousand people. And I think we've learned that using YouTube and video uh, allows us to reach a lot of people with a lot of information in a very timely fashion. Um, then the third thing I'll say is uh, I'm like a lot of A-type leader personalities. You know, we're going to get things done by just working harder, working longer. And, and I think uh, 
the self-care aspects, uh, the mental health aspects are something that I'm much more attuned to, not just me personally, uh, but uh, my leadership team, that we've got to be, as leaders, watching out for those around us a lot more. And if somebody is exhibiting, uh, you know, uh, behavior issues around fatigue, uh, not getting enough rest, uh, those types of things, I can't be passive. I've got to be able to sit down with them and say, hey, you need to take a couple of days off. We need to find a way to, to help you through this. And so those are the things, Mary, I think that immediately come to mind uh, after a 30 second contemplation while you were asking the question. So I'm really glad that you didn't say one of the things you learned is never hire a provost during a global pandemic because that, that would have made me feel bad. <laughs> yeah, one other question that just came in. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Uh, so that $200,000 in funds raised by the Cougar community, a lot of that has been, I think, already used and utilized. I will send a note to Mary on exactly uh, where those monies have been distributed and how they've been used. And so I, I just, the answer is I don't know now. I will tell you this, it's not enough. Um, and I'm not being judgmental here. For example, we needed to do things with um, hotspots and uh, uh, computers for students that lived in either areas with internet issues or did not have the technology they needed to be successful. We spent a couple hundred thousand on making those things available uh, and I use money out of my discretionary fund to do that. That's what it's for. Uh, I'm glad we had those resources, but we've probably spent another three or four hundred thousand dollars in other resources to bring to bear rapidly to help with COVID-19. So uh, I'll get back to you on that. And that's not intended to be private information. I just don't have it with me today. I want to thank you for your uh, presence with us this morning, and I'm going to ask if you have final comments, either you or um, Provost Chilton, um, to leave us with. I'll let Elizabeth go first. Um, well, you know, I started to joke about uh, one should never hire a provost during a global pandemic, but, um, you know, I have a lot of family and friends who just thought that it was insane to move across the country and bring my entire family and move to a state and take accept a job. I, I had not met anybody, that I, anyone that I was going to work with. Um, but I, I can honestly say it, it truly was one of the best decisions I've made in a long time. And I'm really happy to be in, um, in, a, in a community that really cares for each other Kirk really does embody that, um, that, that sort of model of, of self-care. He has a very collaborative leadership style, which means that all voices are heard. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I'm, I'm really glad to be part of the Cougar community. Looking forward to meeting all of you and, and learning more in, in the weeks and months to come. Uh Thank you, Elizabeth. I owe you a bottle of wine for that nice compliment now, um, or a scotch in the evening, let's put it that way. Uh, Mary, thank you uh, for having us. I, it's always exciting to see uh, what the nursing, uh, our College of Nursing is doing, how they're advancing. I love the attitude. It's always a let's roll up our sleeves and find a way to get it done that I really appreciate about uh, you and your colleagues. So congratulations on a great year. Look forward to learning more and supporting uh, this college in any way we can. Uh, I will say too that uh, Joanne also posted something uh, on the chat about faculty have needs for hotspots. Uh, please send something directly to uh, through Mary to Elizabeth. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we're providing uh, anybody who has those kind of needs with those type of resources, that's what they're for. So uh, exactly. let us know and that, that applies to anybody that's on here even if they didn't say anything, especially with the fires and some of the things that have changed uh, people's access to internet or technology. Let us know, we're here to help. So yeah, absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. You too. Take care. Bye.